So, Lord, you heard us. I surrender all. And now, Lord God, I pray that you would preach us home. In Jesus' name, amen. When I was born, my dad was already 42 years old. He'd only been married for a year. Because of World War II and seminary and ministry, he spent most of his life wondering if he'd ever be married or ever have a, a child. I was his only begotten. I was his firstborn. And I had two little sisters that came later on, but I was the only boy. And I was so wanted that it later became kind of embarrassing. I grew up with stories of how he'd carry me around at church and just say to people, I'm going to eat this boy up. And they'd like chew on my stomach and blow bubbles on my belly. And as I would laugh with, with glee, I was so very chosen. And yet I wasn't aware that I was uh, so very chosen because I didn't know what that meant. I began to find out in 1966 when my parents dropped me off for kindergarten the 1960s, you know, were really a terrifying time to be a kid. I think because America was, we were so enamored with our own power. And also, I think with Darwinism and the survival of the fittest. And so in gym class, we always picked teams. I can still feel it in my bones. Just working on this message made me nervous. The PE teacher would pick captains like Benny Gutierrez or George Warfield. And then they would pick players from this group of little boys standing in the dust, hoping to be chosen, hoping to become men. And I was always chosen close to last. And sometimes the captains and the group of already chosen standing around them would argue over, well, who has to have Hyatt? I, well, we don't want Hyatt. Uh, what about Hyatt? I was always chosen close to last because I usually struck out. Just a few years ago, I went to see Dr. Marisa Kruger right back there, and uh, she gave me an eye exam, and she said, hey, Peter, did you used to have trouble hitting baseballs? And like immediately, I, I just wanted to hide, but I said, well, yeah, I guess so. She said, I thought so, because you have a depth perception issue and could have used corrective glasses. And immediately, the first thought that entered my head is, you mean I don't have to hate myself? See, when you struck out in elementary school, at least in the 60s, everyone on your team would yell at you as if it was uh, your fault because you just weren't trying hard enough, as if you didn't care about hitting the baseball. But more than anything in the world, I wanted to hit the ball. But the harder I tried to hit the ball, the more I struck out. I said that I was picked close to last because usually Duncan or Matt were picked dead last. And ironically, I loved that they were picked dead last because then I wasn't picked dead last. So you see, in fear for myself, I delighted in their unchosenness. I delighted in their failure. I also delighted in Benny and George's failure on math tests and spelling bees. And in my heart, you know, I kind of blame them. I go, those guys, they don't really care about math or spelling. I figured they didn't try hard enough. They didn't want to do well at math or spelling. But, but what little kid doesn't do, want to do well at math and spelling and hitting baseballs? Well, from gym class and the kids on the bus that would pick on me because I was a pastor kid, I, I learned that I was often the unchosen but when I got home, if I could just get to my father's lap, I could rest in this place where I knew that I was relentlessly chosen and that I could do nothing to be unchosen. On my father's lap, I just knew I was home. I was aware that I was chosen but I didn't know why I was chosen. In other words, I couldn't see what it was that dad saw in me, and now I know what he saw in me 
was the eye that wondered what it was that he saw in me. That's what he saw in me, the thing that I could not see. You discover this, you know, when you become a father or a, a, a mother or even a babysitter. The thing that's so priceless in every little child is the thing that they can't choose or unchoose, but that wonders if it's chosen. James chapter 4, verse 5, God yearns jealously over the spirit, the pneuma, the breath, that he has made to dwell in us. You know, in the beginning, God breathed his breath, his spirit into you, and he yearns to commune with that spirit, his own spirit in you, but, but right now it's hiding in fig leaves, report cards, and baseball statistics. It's hiding in the judgments of men, and you are one of those men. About 15 years ago, um, I got to know a, a man who'd been attending our church. His name was Rich. And at lunch, he told me his story. In 1968, when he was six years old, he lived in the Cabrini Greens housing project in Chicago. He was one of 10 children from six different men. So he didn't know his, his father. Almost everyone in the projects was black. And Rich thought that he was black too until the riots broke out and then he realized that he was the wrong color. One night when the violence grew particularly bad, he said policemen came and they removed his family from the projects. They placed uh, his family in, in a makeshift shelter in a nearby Catholic church. There were many children in the room in which I slept, said Rich. But that night, a Catholic priest entered the room and chose me. He took Rich to this private place, and there he molested him. And then he told Rich that he had been chosen because God didn't love him, <laughs> didn't choose to love him. For the next 34 years, Rich's life was cloaked in loneliness, addiction, broken relationships, and shame, and, and the priest, he went on to become a cardinal, said Rich. <laughs> now, I've known a lot of other people like Rich, not abused by priests necessarily, but abused by a whole lot of other people, people who think that they were chosen to be unchosen by God. And, and whether that's true or not true, you have to wonder why would God even allow for people to think such a thing or to experience such a thing? In the Catholic tradition, a priest is called father, for he is to represent our father in heaven. And so Rich was terrified of being seen by God the Father. And yet, you know, every little kid longs to be chosen because they are seen seen truly by their dad. In his book, No Exit, Jean-Paul Sartre pictures hell as a room full of people with no eyelids. So for Sartre, hell was being seen. I can see and be seen, argued Sartre, but God cannot be seen. He can only see. Therefore, if God exists, I am reduced to a mere object of his gaze. Consequently, to be truly human, there must be no unseen seer, no God. Apparently, for Sartre, hell is being seen by God. And yet, to not be seen at all is like to cease to exist. There's a tribe in South Africa whose traditional greeting goes something like this. I, I heard, I see you, I am here. I think, uh, what's his name, stole that for Avatar. Whatever. But they believe that you don't exist unless... Someone sees you. Amazingly, that's also the implication of quantum mechanics. According to Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, matter is fundamentally uncertain until its quantum state is collapsed through observation, that is, through being seen. And yet, if Scripture is right, you matter even more than matter, for into your dust, that is, your matter, the unseen seer has placed his own spirit. Well, my point is, 
that we're all terrified to be seen. And yet, if no one sees us, we don't exist. Or we go insane. Like the invisible man in H.G. Wells' novel. Or, you know, Kevin Bacon in that movie, Hollow Man. Or uh, like Golem with his ring of power, the power that made him invisible, uh, and, and the Lord of, of the Rings, or, or like, well, like Adam and Eve. Remember how they listened to a lie and they took the fruit longing to know? And then they hid from the way, the truth, and the life, trapped in death and sanity and confusion. Like them, we don't want to be seen. And yet each one of us longs to be seen and then chosen. Being seen can be hell or heaven. When my kids were little, they would constantly say, see me, see me, see me, daddy, see me, see me, see me. See, it was like they literally thought that nothing mattered until I saw it, until I saw them. In my experience, the greatest ecstasy is to be fully seen and then chosen by your covenant partner for the most intimate communion. In other words, it's to be naked and then clothed with love. Perhaps the difference between heaven and hell is the character of the one who sees you. Or better yet, faith, which means trust in the character of the one who sees you. And so in my way of thinking, nothing matters more than how God sees those like us who often feel unchosen. Do any of you ever feel unchosen? I see those knots. For 1,500 years, most of the institutional church has argued that whether um, the unchosen are unchosen because of a choice that they've made or unchosen before they could even make a choice, whatever the case, the unchosen are chosen by God for endless conscious torment in hell. It's an idea that I find impossible to believe when I believe all of Scripture. And I really mean all of Scripture, every verse. Scripture just does not allow for endless conscious torment. And yet no one can deny that our all-powerful, all-knowing Creator does arrange for people like me and you and Rich and basically everyone in the Bible to at least feel unchosen for a time. Genesis 12, for no apparent reason, God just chooses a guy named Abram and, strangely enough, his seed. Sing it, seed, how weird. We preached about this extensively, you know, when we preached through Romans, but in the process of choosing Abraham's seed, there are others who realize that they are not chosen, namely Eliezer, Hagar, and Ishmael. So this is the question. How does God feel about them? Genesis 15, verse 1, after these things, after Abram and Sarai uh, go to Egypt, and many years after God says to Abram, I bless you in order to be a, a blessing, well, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Fear not, Abram, I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. But Abram said, O Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless. And the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, you have given me no seed. And a member, a slave of my household, will be my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. This man shall not be your heir. Your very own son shall be your heir. So Eliezer loses all that belongs to Abraham because God informs Abraham that his seed will inherit all that belongs to Abraham, which ironically would include Eliezer, wouldn't it? Anyway, Eliezer is unchosen. He's an unchosen Syrian slave. And for some reason, we've been trained to think that guys like Eliezer you know, have never prayed in the name of Jesus before they died. Guys who never chose to be 
chosen. We've been trying to think that guys like that will never go to heaven, but instead, guys like Eliezer will be endlessly tormented in a place called hell, where well, they'll cry out for water to save them because of the flame, and, and none will be given to them because they are endlessly separated from heaven by a chasm that none can cross. And yet there's nothing in this text that would even imply that, and I've searched and searched in the New Testament, and I haven't found that. Nonetheless, Eliezer is not chosen. And that must have been a terrible disappointment to Eliezer. Have any of you ever been disappointed by God? <laughs> okay, there's a hand. Maybe to, have people just looking like, yes, you have. There, okay, thank you. That was with a bunch of idiots or something. Anyway, Genesis 16. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children. She had an Egyptian slave girl, should be translated slave girl, whose name was Hagar. And Sarai said to Abram, Behold, now the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. Go into my slave girl. It may be that I shall obtain children by her. And Abram listened to the voice of Sarai. Sarai is choosing to be chosen, right? If you think that you can choose to be chosen, aren't you choosing to believe that you are not the chosen, but the chooser? Well, anyway, verse 3. So after Abram had lived 10 years in the land of Canaan, Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar the Egyptian, her servant, and gave her to Abram, her husband, as a wife. And he went into Hagar, and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, she looked with dishonor on her mistress. And Sarai said to Abram, May the wrong done to me be on you. I gave my slave girl to your embrace, and when you saw, and when she saw that she had conceived, she looked on me with dishonor. May the Lord, may Yahweh, judge between you and me. But Abram said to Sarai, Behold, your slave is in your power. Do to her as you please. Then Sarai afflicted her. She was under affliction, probably whipped her, leaving stripes on her back. And Hagar fled from her. Can you imagine how Hagar feels? All of her life, she's been an object. She's a slave girl. Probably um, her skin's the wrong color. She's the wrong race. She may have never been loved in all her life. And now the only people perhaps that she felt a little love from is her mister and her mistress and her master, and, and now they've rejected her. And she's not just rejected by them. I bet she feels, well, forsaken by God. Because for 10 years, what has she heard? Stories about this promised child, the chosen one. And so she had hoped. But now her child was chosen to be unchosen. Maybe even cursed. Because God had told Abraham, the one who dishonors you, same, same word for dishonor there, dishonor, I will curse. Hagar had dishonored Sarai. And Sarai and Abram were one. Hagar must have felt cursed and intensely ashamed. Her very existence was fundamentally uncertain. She, she wanted to hide. She felt like rich. Genesis 16, verse 7. The angel of Yahweh found her by a spring of water in the wilderness, the spring on the way to Shur, and he said, Hagar, slave girl of Sarai, where have you come from and where are you going? She said, I'm fleeing from my mistress Sarai. The angel of Yahweh said to her, return to your mistress and literally be under affliction by her. The angel of the Lord, the angel of Yahweh, also said to her, I will surely multiply your seed so that he can be, cannot be numbered, cannot be numbered for the multitude. And the angel of the Lord said to her, Behold, you are pregnant, and you shall bear a son. Now, that should sound vaguely familiar to you, right? Behold, you are pregnant, and you will bear a son. You shall call his name Ishmael. It means God hears. Because the Lord has listened to your Affliction. What a weird thing to say. He shall be a wild donkey. I like King James. He'll be a wild ass of a man. Now, that's not necessarily bad. It could mean something like he's going to be like the Italian stallion. 
His hand against everyone and everyone's hand against him, and he shall dwell over against all his kinsmen. So she called the name of Yahweh who spoke to her, You are a God of seeing, in Hebrew, El Roy. So are you getting this? Hagar is not consigned to endless conscious torment in hell. Instead, she receives a promise, vaguely reminiscent of the one given to Mother Mary, and it appears that she has faith in God, which according to Paul in Galatians 4 means that she's a child of the promise. Even though Sarai is the one now pregnant with the promise, Sarai can't see the promise, but maybe Hagar can. And then, to top it off, I love this. She names Yahweh. How crazy is that? Isn't he the one that names everything? She names Yahweh. She's got a pet name for Yahweh. She calls him Elroy. And he doesn't smite her. In fact, he seems to kind of like it. Verse 13, so she called the name of Yahweh who spoke to her Elroy. For she said, truly here, here I have seen Ra'ah, him who sees or looks Ra'ah after me. Now that's a challenging sentence to translate. So it appears um, in many different uh, forms and it seems to mean many different things all at once. So the NRSV translates her words as this. Have I really seen God and remained alive after seeing him? The New King James translates her words as, have I also here seen him who sees me? Whatever the translation, it appears that there was something about that place. That place in which she felt unchosen and dishonored. That place in which she had felt all of her fig leaves stripped away. Something about that place that allowed her to see that she was chosen. Chosen to see the one who sees her. And she realized that when she saw the one who saw her, if she died, she must somehow also have lived. For we all know that no one can look on the face of Yahweh and live. So what do you suppose that she saw? We know that she saw God, right? Who looked like a man. And an angel means messenger was delivering a message. In all of scripture, she's the very first of whom it is explicitly stated that she sees him and recognizes him her helper, her azer in Hebrew, her, her husband, Elroy, who sees her now stripped of all her fig leaves and delights in her. Hmm. Adam couldn't find his helper, his azer. But Hagar can. In Genesis 12, it said that Yahweh appeared to Abram. Genesis 15, Abram has a vision of the word. But here in Genesis 16, Hagar sees the one who sees her. Do you remember to whom it was that Jesus first chose to reveal his identity in the Gospel of John? It was a Samaritan woman sitting by a well. A Samaritan woman who is unchosen. <laughs> Unchosen six times by six men, which makes Jesus the, the seventh man. Anyway, Hagar is not chosen. She's not chosen to be named as the great, great, great grandmother of Jesus, but she is chosen to see Jesus, and when she sees Jesus, I bet she sees her stripes on his back. I, I, bet, I bet she sees her shame imprinted on his body. Hagar was unchosen in order to be chosen to see that she was saved by Yahashua. Yahweh is salvation. Wow. Verse 13. So she called the name of Yahweh who spoke to her, Elroy. For she said, truly here I have seen him who sees me and sees after me. Therefore the well was called Bir Lahai Roy, which means the well of the living one who sees me. It lies between Kadesh and Bered, and Hagar bore Abram a son. And Abram called the name of his son, whom Hagar bore, Ishmael. Abram was 86 years old when Hagar bore Ishmael to Abram. So if you know the story, you know Abram, uh, she goes back, Abram receives Ishmael back as his first born an only son. And for 13 years, he appears to think that Ishmael is the promised seed by whom all the families of the earth will be blessed. We know this because in the next chapter, God appears to Abram, whom he now calls Abraham, and he tells him that Sarai, whom he now calls Sarah, shall give birth to a son. And 99-year-old Abraham just starts laughing. 
He just starts, that's crazy. And then, and then he says this, well, what about Ishmael? Oh, that Ishmael would live before you. God then tells Abraham to circumcise himself. That's so cool. I didn't write the Bible, but I just think it's funny. Tells him to circumcise himself, Ishmael and his whole household, which would include Eliezer. And circumcision does not mean now God will endlessly torture you. It means something like, sorry that hurt, but this means that you are now part of the family of God. When Ishmael's 14, having grown up as the firstborn and only son of Abraham, Isaac is born. And Isaac means he laughs, Itzhak. Genesis 21.8, and the child grew and was named, was weaned, he's a weenie, and Abraham made a great feast on the day that Isaac, Itzhak, was weaned. But Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, whom she had borne to Abraham, laughing from Sahak, like Itzhak, Sahak. So she said to Abraham, cast out this slave woman with her son, for the son of the slave woman shall not be heir with my son, my, my son Isaac. Now, in Galatians 4, Paul writes that there's this fascinating spiritual allegory here between the new covenant and the old covenant, between the Jerusalem above, who's represented by Sarah, and the old Jerusalem, who's represented by Hagar. But the allegory doesn't apply to some people as opposed to old people. It applies to each person with a new self and an old self. And here it's abundantly clear that Sarah, she really still has an old self, right? Because she sees 14-year-old Ishmael laughing, and she resents his laughter, because she's the mother of laughter. How dare that bastard laugh? He can't be blessed if my son is blessed. And yet her son is blessed to be a blessing to what? All the families of the earth. You know, the family of Isaac is now known as the Jews. And the family of Ishmael is now known as the Arabs. And so it appears that all of us are still an awful lot like Sarah. Because we think, well, how the hell could both of them be blessed? They'd have to, like, share. Well, whatever the case, 14 years earlier, Sarah chose to be chosen, which revealed that she wasn't chosen, which is a lie. Now Sarah thinks she is chosen because another is not chosen, which means that she has chosen to be alone which is hell. But don't panic, because Sarah will give birth to salvation even though she still hasn't seen him herself. A lot to think about there, Mother Church. Cast out this slave woman with her son, for the son of this slave woman shall not be heir with my son Isaac. And the thing was very displeasing to Abraham on account of his son. He loves Ishmael. But God said to Abraham, be not displeased because of the boy and because of the slave woman. He loves Hagar. Whatever Sarah says to you, do as she tells you, for through Isaac shall your seed be named." And I will make a nation of the son of the slave woman also, because he is your seed. Ah, do you get that? Both boys are Abraham's seed. Both boys will be blessed. In fact, Ishmael, we learn, will be the father of 12 princes, which should sound a little familiar, 12 sons. Both boys will be blessed, but the seed by whom all the nations of the world will be blessed will be named through Isaac. Salvation is from the Jews, said Jesus, the king of the Jews, to the outcast Samaritan sitting at the well who saw him and recognized him first. So Abraham rose early in the morning and took bread and a skin of water and gave it to Hagar, putting it on her shoulder along with the, the child, Yelid, the boy, and sent her away. Imagine how that felt for Ishmael. I mean, he must have thought, my father, my father, why have you forsaken me? And she departed and wandered in the wilderness of Beersheba. When the water in the skin was gone, she put the boy under one of the bushes. Then she went and sat down opposite him a good way off, about the distance of a bow shot, for she said, don't let me look on the, on the death of the boy. And as she sat opposite him, she lifted up her voice and wept. 
and God heard the voice of the boy. And the angel of God, not an angel, but the angel, the God-man, called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, What troubles you, Hagar? Fear not, for God has heard the voice of the boy where he is. See, there's something about where he is that is related to how God hears him. Now, God hears everything that's anything, right? But God does not respond to everything, or at least what we think is everything. But God does respond to Ishmael in this place where he feels forsaken. He feels unchosen, stripped of all his fig leaves and good as dead. And what do you suppose Ishmael had said which God had heard? Perhaps Yahweh, save me, Yahshua. Or maybe, God, hear me, El Azer. Anyway, Hagar was unchosen because she had always been chosen to see her helper, her husband, the messenger of Yahweh, the God-man Jesus. And apparently Ishmael was unchosen, for he had always been chosen to be heard by Yahweh, his father. Verse 18, up, kum, arise, Hebrew. May have been what Jesus said to Lazarus in the tomb. Up, arise, lift up the boy and hold him fast with your hand, for I will make him into a great nation. Then God opened her eyes and she saw a well of water. So in the wilderness, there is this deep well, actually a spring of living water. Few people can see it now. However, the afflicted and unchosen are chosen to drink from it. You must lose your life to find it. And she went and filled the skin with water and gave the boy a drink. And God was with the boy, and he grew up. He lived in the wilderness and became an expert with the bow. He lived in the wilderness of Paran, and his mother took a wife for him from the land of Egypt. The last we read of Ishmael, he's with his brother Isaac, and together they are are burying their father, Abraham. Just like the last we hear of the man Esau, he's with his brother Jacob, and together they're burying their father, Abraham. Isaac, Jacob and Esau, Isaac and Ishmael, they must have called their father our father. Rich told me that the day after he was molested by the priest who told them that our father did not love him, he and his siblings were then moved to another shelter. He told me that he so clearly remembers lying in the dark that following night, six years old, just weeping and trying not to weep. He was utterly terrified of being heard or seen because he thought it was all his fault, and yet he so longed to be seen and heard and chosen by someone good. He he lay alone in the dark, six years old, fighting back a river of tears. There in that place, said Rich, where I was, I heard a voice. It was so clear that I got up and looked in the other room to see who was talking. The voice said, Richard, it wasn't your fault. He said, Peter, I I must have heard that voice and those words hundreds of, a hundred times or more after that. For years I wondered, but I did not know who was speaking. Thirty-four years later, an Anglican priest in Evergreen told Rich who it was that was speaking. And he began to see Jesus. Shortly after that, Rich started attending our church, and it was a thrill for me to tell him, Hey, Rich, my dad is your dad. And your dad is my dad. Our dad. I've become fascinated with how the unchosen turn out to have always been chosen. Chosen to not only be saved, but chosen to see the Savior in his greatest glory. And chosen to hear the most beautiful words from our Father. For years I prayed with a friend who had been ritually wed to Satan by her own father. And yet our Father in heaven repeatedly showed her visions revealing that she was actually wed to his Son and our Lord Jesus. 
I prayed with another friend who had been ritually entombed by her father, but saw that Jesus had always been with her, and together they rose, and she heard him say, little sister, my daddy is your daddy, and your daddy is my daddy. See, I've been amazed at how the unchosen are chosen, and then I've been utterly sobered at how the chosen are unchosen for a time. See, it wasn't only Ishmael that felt unchosen by Abraham and by God. You remember how God told Abraham to take Isaac, Isaac to Mount Moriah, which is also Mount Zion, which is also Mount Calvary, and there offer him as a burnt offering. You know that he would have been about 14 years old at the time. And so at some point on that day, he must have looked at his dad and said, my father, my father, why have you forsaken me? And it wasn't only Hagar that felt unchosen. Sarah had also felt unchosen for quite a while. And, and just as Hagar the Egyptian had been a slave to Abraham and Sarah, Sarah and her sons, the Israelites, the Israelites would be slaves in Egypt for 400 years. And if you remember, Joseph was sold into Egypt by Ishmaelites. Israel was again chosen, like you know, because there's a movie about it, and led out of Egypt by Moses, but they would again be unchosen, led into captivity in Assyria and Babylon. I know, I know we are the chosen people. But once in a while, can't you choose someone else? Love that. Somebody else, please. <laughs> See, we always assume that whenever Scripture refers to someone as elect or chosen, that they're chosen for eternal salvation. Or maybe they're chosen for endless conscious torment in hell. But that's not the way the Scripture uses that term chosen or elect. Listen to this, Isaiah 14.1. Yahweh will have compassion on Jacob and again choose Israel. Again Choose Israel because for a time, I guess, Israel was unchosen and exiled from home. Just like I had been exiled from my father's lap when he and my mom sent me off to school where I was unchosen by my fellow baseball players. Romans 9 through 11 was all about this. Remember that we spent two years on? Remember the mystery of the unchosen chosen? And then Paul concludes his argument with Romans 11.32. God has consigned all to disobedience. And what is disobedience? It's lack of faith. Faith that you have been chosen by grace. God has consigned all to disobedience that he may have mercy on all. And what is God's mercy on all? Salvation by grace. Through faith. And this faith not of yourselves. It's knowledge that you have always been chosen. And so in the very place, this special place, where you were called not my people, you will be called sons of the living God. So there is a place in which we must all experience rejection in space and time in order to come to know that we are elect from, to, and for all eternity. I didn't know what it meant to be chosen until I was unchosen in baseball and returned home to my father's lap where I knew that I was always chosen and never unchosen in him. And so I freely chose to be who I always am, his beloved. In Romans and Isaiah, we learned that all of Israel, then all of Judah is unchosen, well, except for one the only begotten, the only begotten Son of God. And so we, the unchosen, we all reject him by nailing him to a tree. And there he accepts all of us and gives to each of us his own body and his own blood. So he not only accepts us in him, God chooses us. For God chooses him in us and that choice is the revelation of who we truly are. We are the body of the chosen one, the beloved. 
So like I was saying, it's not only Ishmael, it's not only Hagar, it's not only Eliezer who are not chosen. You know, Jesus told a story about a rich man and a guy, a poor man named Lazarus. We don't know the rich man's name. People tried to come up with it at times, but we don't know. Um, uh, But I think the people who heard it probably knew. A rich man and Lazarus, uh, the two end up on the opposite sides of a chasm that none can cross. Jesus was talking to Jews at the time, and he points out that the rich man had five brothers. And every Jew knew that Judah had five brothers, all the children, the sons of of Leah. They knew that Judah had five brothers and that their tribe was the rich tribe because they had been chosen. And from them would come the king of the Jews. The rich man is being tormented in Hades. And so he begs his father Abraham to send Lazarus with a drink. As if Lazarus, you know, was like his servant or slave. In Jesus' day, Lazarus was the common form of the ancient name Eliezer, which means God is helper. And as you know, Eliezer was Abraham's Syrian slave who was unchosen so that others would be chosen. Eliezer, that is Lazarus, is now in Abraham's bosom. John 1.18, no one has ever seen God. The only begotten in the bosom, the kolpas, or on the lap, kolpas, it's also translated lap, of the Father, he has made him known. Eliezer, that is Lazarus, is in the bosom of Abraham. Uh, so Eliezer not only inherits the Middle East, he inherits Abraham. <laughs> and everything with Abraham, and he's utterly at home on his lap. Wow, what a picture. Judah is on the other side of the chasm because he wouldn't help poor Lazarus who had been lying at his door. And why wouldn't he help Lazarus? Well, because he believed that he was chosen. And Lazarus, the last of the least of these, was not chosen. And now if you're worried about Judah in Hades on the other side of the chasm, you must remember that Jesus is the king of the Judeans, that's the Jews, and he is the promised seed of Abraham that comes through the Jews but is blessed to be a blessing to all the families of the earth, which would include Syria, Egypt, Arabia, America, but especially Judah, the Jews. No man can simply cross the chasm, but Jesus descends into hell, transforms hell into heaven, and he levels every chasm, Isaiah 40, Luke chapter 3. And now I know that all of this probably sounds incredibly complex, but I think it may all be remarkably simple, so pay attention. You, if you just heard my voice say you, I'm talking to you. You are chosen. And you have always been chosen. Everything that's anything has been chosen by God with his word, who is his judgment. Everything that's anything, in other words, is his creation. All things are chosen by God who is love, but not all things truly know that they are chosen. But you have been predestined to know. That knowledge is life and it is eternal. Jesus says so much at the start of his prayer than the night that he's betrayed. The knowledge is life and it's eternal. But to truly know that you are chosen, perhaps you must experience being not chosen in space and time. If you truly know that you are chosen... In other words, if you experience being chosen, it means that at one time you were not chosen. Or at least believed that you were not chosen. In the same way, if you experience being saved, it means that at one time you were not saved. Or at least believed that you were not saved. You can't be saved unless you were not saved. In the same way, if you know the good and the life, it may mean that at one time you experienced evil and you thought that, you know, you were just good as dead. 
And so God breathes his breath into dust, making Adam. If you wonder, what does God see in you? What does God see? What does God see? He sees himself. (laughs) That's what God the Father sees in me. God breathes his breath into dust, making Adam, and places Adam in a garden with a tree and an evil talking snake. Adam believes a lie and takes knowledge in order to make choices to create himself and so be chosen by his creator who has always chosen him. But if one chooses to be chosen, it just reveals that one is not the chosen but the chooser, which is, of course, the lie that leaves a spirit utterly alone. So instead of making himself good, Adam makes the bad And he begins to hide himself in the bad. Fig leaves that he has fashioned into clothes and pretends are himself. He's hiding his true self in a a false self. It's that false self that must be unchosen for Adam to know that he's always been chosen by the chooser of all things. Adam must die to himself to see the one who's always seen him. For when he sees him, he will know that he's not the chooser, but the chosen. He will know that he's always been chosen. And yet, once he sees that he's always been chosen, he can begin to freely choose the chooser. He can begin to love love and choose all things with him. In other words, he can sit on his father's lap and endlessly enjoy his home, which is heaven. Now, you know this from experience. It's the chosen unchosen that freely choose to love their neighbor, right? And it's the chosen unchosen that freely choose to love their Lord, that freely choose to be who they actually are, the image and likeness of God. The point of election is not that some are chosen and others are not chosen, but that God is the chooser. And you cannot choose the good until you know that you have been chosen by the good, who is your God. So maybe right now you feel unchosen. Maybe you applied for the job over and over and over again and you're never chosen. Maybe you just went through a divorce. Oh, gosh. I can't even imagine. Maybe you just learned that you have cancer. You go, why me? Maybe you're remembering some abuse that happened decades ago. Maybe you've always felt uncoordinated and you always struck out. Maybe you've always felt dumb and you've wondered, why didn't God choose for me to be smart or or pretty or funny or popular? Maybe you feel like whatever you do, it's just not enough. Maybe you feel unchosen. If so, I'm convinced that you are in a sacred place. For you have been chosen to see that you have always been chosen. You've been chosen to see the one that sees you. He takes bread and breaks it, saying, this is my body given to you. And he takes the cup, saying, this is the covenant in my blood, poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Drink of it, all of you, and do it in remembrance of me. This is the chosen one. And wow, he looks kind of unchosen. Jesus is chosen to be unchosen by all of us. And perhaps, at least for a moment in space and time, he's chosen to believe along with us that he is forsaken by God. And 
then chosen to know that he has always been chosen, and even more than chosen, he is the eternal choice of God. So he says, take and eat, take and drink. It's God the Father who chooses, and it's God the Son who knows that he is chosen in you. So you would know that you are chosen in him. So how could you possibly be more chosen? Pray with me. And if you can, make these words your words. Jesus, thank you for the experience of being last and least. For now I see that you are last and least with me. Thank you for the times that I have felt unchosen. For now I'm beginning to see that we have always been chosen. I'm beginning to see the one who always sees me. Me. That is who it is that I am and we are. Amen. And Lord Jesus, we know from Scripture that you are the righteousness of God. Wow. So thank you for giving us your righteousness. And your righteousness is a choice. A choice that you make, a free choice, a powerful choice. It's the choice of the Creator. So, Lord God, that you give us your choice, that we choose with you, even sit next to you on a throne as you control the universe. Lord, we have entirely underestimated your plans for us, your love for us, your goodness for us. So thank you. We're beginning to see you. Amen. So this week, may you see the one who sees you. And when you truly see him, you will be uh, overwhelmed by this shocking reality, and that is that you're not the chooser. You're the chosen by the chooser. And yet, when you come to believe that you're the chosen by the chooser, then for the first time, you are free to choose the chooser. <laughs> you're free to choose the good. In other words, this week, I hope you make time, like I try to do this in the morning, just to picture yourself sitting on his lap, being held close to his kolpas in his bosom. And when you do that, if you sit there, if you really sit there, you'll want to squirm. There's something in you that will want to squirm up. That's your chooser. That's your ego. But just, just sit there and realize that you are the chosen and then maybe for the first time, you'll be able to choose the good in freedom. Believe the gospel. Amen.